Good afternoon. Good evening. I extend a warm welcome to all the people who are joining us in the special webinar number 145 organized by the Andean Health Organization Hippolito Unano Agreement. This cycle of webinars began in May 2020. This year we are celebrating 50 years of ORAS CONJU, a very sensitive and significant anniversary due to the difficult time we're going through. However, as a reference in health in the region, we continue uninterruptedly the joint and coordinated actions with the six member countries, Bolivia, Colombia, Chile, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. Thus, fulfilling the goals and objectives to strengthen the health of our people. As a reference in health, we highlight, we celebrate every October 19, the Breast Cancer Day. Since 1992, Evelyn Lauder, the senior vice president of the National Development Fragrance of a Private Company, was diagnosed with breast cancer. She got together with Alexander Nide, the editor of a journal, who created the pink bow that we use in this uh, day. This pink lace became the world's symbol, a fight against breast cancer. Vaccination against COVID-19 is safe and effective to protect ourselves and others. The more people immunize, the less likely they are to become infected. Make sure you and your families get the second, third, or fourth dose as appropriate. There is no excuse for missing the COVID-19 vaccination schedule. The socioeconomic and environmental context in Latin America and the Caribbean shapes a scenario in which hunger, food, insecurity, and malnutrition have increased. Policy decisions are required to achieve sustainable, sufficient, inclusive, efficient agri-food system that generate equal access to a healthy diet for all. Climate change threatens life, health, and well-being. However, we can contribute to its preservation from wherever we are, generating social policies and a sustainable development model by joining an initiative in defense of the environment, buying local products and plant-based foods. We can use public transport, cycling or walking, as well as reducing consumption by reusing, repairing, and recycling. It is everyone's duty to restore the relationship with nature. It is necessary to recognize the ancestral knowledge of the native peoples who have lived in balance with Mother Earth and practice good living. Well, in accordance with what has been said, today, Tuesday, October 20, we open our virtual doors to discuss a topic of great importance for our region with this year's webinar number 145 entitled Reality of Breast Cancer Prevention and Control. We invite you to leave us your name, organization, and country from which you're joining us through the comment box in the Facebook Live or YouTube Live chat. In that same space, you can leave your questions or send them via email to webinar or at gmail.com. To access the certificate of attendance of this webinar, as usual, you must fill out a short survey and leave your data in the fixed link found in the Facebook Live and YouTube Live chats. The certificate will be sent to your email in the next few days. This webinar will be developed with the usual dynamics. We will start with the institutional reading, then the presentations of our speakers, the active pause, and the space for Q&A. To begin this important day, I give the floor to Dr. Maria El Carmen Calle, Executive Secretary of Horas Conju, who will give the welcome and the institutional greeting. 
Go ahead, Dr. Calle. Thank you very much, Lucho. The Andean Health Organization and Policy and Agreement is an institution of integration and is the reference in health in the Andean sub region that has been working strongly to promote and position in the Andes country, in the Andes countries. Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. A technical and sustained effort in the different regional priorities. Breast cancer in women has become the oncological disease with the highest morbid mortality in the world and has displaced lung cancer which for more than two decades was the most widespread malignant tumor and caused the highest number of death. According to statistics compiled by the WHO, in 2020, more than 2.2 million cases of breast cancer were diagnosed with around 685,000 women dying worldwide that year. In the Americas, more than 491,000 women are diagnosed with breast cancer and almost 106, 381 die from this disease. And it is estimated that by 2040, the number of new cases diagnosed per year will increase to more than 39%. And the number of women who die will increase to more than 52%. In Latin America and the Caribbean, the highest percentage of deaths from this disease, equivalent to 50%, occurs in women under 65 years of age, compared to North America where 37% die in the same age range. This situation in itself serious projects a greater burden of breast cancer in middle and low income countries, evidencing the increasingly frequent occurrence in young women due to late detection due to great difficulties in access to diagnosis and treatment. To address the serious public health problem generated by cancer, the Andean Ministries of Health and the Andean Health Organization, Hippolito Unano Agreement, have prepared the Andean Policy on Cancer Prevention and Control, which has 10 major strategic lines, such as the development of the model of comprehensive cancer care by life course. Second, the promotion and education of healthy lifestyles and cancer risk control. Three, the organization and implementation of a preventive and timely response for screening, detection, and specialized diagnosis. Four, the strengthening of the Andean Cancer Prevention and Control Network to control the damage caused by cancer. Fifth, the improvement of the quality of life of survival, the strengthening of the regulation and control in prevention and control of cancer the training in prevention and control in human talent, the strengthening of the information system and research system in cancer, the increase of financial protection for cancer prevention and control, and promoting social and intersectoral participation in the response to cancer. These strategic guidelines address 
cross-cutting problems that are a priority in different life courses, being unavoidable concrete actions against childhood cancer, which for years has been insufficiently addressed and today poses great challenges to change the lives of many children, their families and communities. Likewise, it is an urgent commitment to reduce morbidity and early mortality through early detection and timely care of cancer as part of the response to non-communicable diseases. All of them have a broad economic and social impact that stem from inequity in development and subject many individuals, families in the community in general to intergenerational intergenerational suffering. We are working. So at the next meeting of Andean Ministries of Health in November on 2022, this Andean policy can be approved and then begin the preparation for the Andean plan for cancer prevention and control for the period 2023-2030. In order to allow a better understanding of the reality of breast cancer and the actions being taken in the health sector, we are pleased to present outstanding professionals from the Andean countries invited to this webinar. We start with Dr. Claudia Parra from the National Cancer Institute of Chile, Dr. Jorge Dunstan, from the National Institute of Neoplastic Diseases of Peru, Dr. Ivan Maldonado from the Metropolitan Hospital of Quito, Ecuador, and Dr. Luis Revilla from the National Center for Epidemiology, Prevention and Disease Control of Peru. Welcome all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mariel Carmen for the welcome and your initial comments. After this greeting, we will start this event by welcoming Dr. Revilla. Dr. Revilla is a medical epidemiologist graduated from the State University of Medias of Rostov on Don, Russia, specialist in field epidemiology from the Peruvian University Cayetano Heredia. He has a master's degree in epidemiology from the Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos and a master's degree in environmental audit and management from the Ibero-American International University. He teaches at the Universidad San Martín de Porres and currently do works in the National Center for Epidemiology and Disease Prevention and Control of Peruvian Ministry of Health. He is also the National Coordinator of Epidemiological Surveillance of Cancer and Diabetes. Welcome, dear Dr. Lu Revilla, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Bengolea. Allow me to share my slides. I'm going to make introduction to this topic Today, we're going to have outstanding speakers. So I'm going to give you an overview of cancer in the Andean subregion, indicating the importance that breast cancer has. And I will conclude by with a reflection of the link that needs to exist between the information that we epidemiologists collect and the interventions that are developed in public health in order to face a problem such as breast cancer. So I think Dr. Maril Carmen Calle mentioned the cancer in worldwide. This is data provided by WHO through Global Can this international agency of research in cancer and show us the world map, what is the magnitude of cancer in the different continent and countries. It is obvious that cancer in the countries in the North, North America and Europe, Australia 
have a much higher burden than in other countries that are in under development. And this can be seen in the map in South America, where the countries that have reached a higher development have a greater problem with cancer. For some countries where we have in the Andean sub-region, we have Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Bolivia, and Venezuela. In terms of magnitude of incidence rates are still low in comparison with developed country, but the, grow, the trend is to grow and to go to those numbers. It is obvious that we expect that the estimated numbers of breast cancer will increase year after year. And the world statistics from Global can show that the millions of women are going to be affected in time. And this is easy to find in the statistics. I would like to talk about the importance of cancer in the cancers of the Andean group. And I will start by showing some graphs that are part of the report of cancer in the Andean sub-region that was prepared by the Andean Health Organization. Here we have Bolivia, the magnitude of cancer and the structure of cancer in Bolivia and the position that breast cancer occupies is the third leading cause. And we can see in this pie chart where they show the importance that the different types of cancer have. And the type of cancer has been painted in color. Breast, breast cancer is pink and it's number three. And we can see that in Bolivia, the cervical cancer is the leading cause followed by prostate and breast cancer in third place. Comparatively, Chile, Breast cancer is also in the third position, according to data from Global Count of 2020. First, we have prostate, and second, we have colorectal cancer, which is also an issue that is growing up in our countries. Breast cancer in Chile has the third position in the global scope of specific cases of cancer mortality but we restrict the analysis to the group of women when they find that breast cancer, breast cancer is number one. And according to world data from Global Can, there is a small difference with the national data, and that's going to depend about the statistics and population registry that each country has. The data from Global Can are useful to compare one country with another, but the national data, of course, are gonna be more relevant if they are available, like in some countries like Chile. So I would like to mention this area because in the national data from Chile, of the four population of registry that Chile has, breast cancer is a leading disease in women, and then we have cervical cancer with a significantly lower rate, but it's still present. In Colombia, cervical cancer has the first leading cause that we can see in this pie chart and the magnitude that breast cancer has followed by prostate and colorectal cancer. We need to look at those details. In Ecuador, breast cancer is also in the leading cause of cancer with a similar structure to Colombia. In Peru, breast cancer is number two, followed by prostate cancer, and then we have stomach cancer. This is incidence. And Venezuela, breast cancer also is in first position, followed by prostate and stomach cancer. And then we prepare this graph for women according to the incidence rates of the different types of cancer with different colors. 
to see how the priority cancers incidence is present in the Andean countries. In four countries, breast cancer is number one, except in Bolivia, that is replaced by cervical cancer. In the other countries, the, the first position, in Chile, in Colombia, it's followed by colorectal cancer. And in Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela, it's followed by cervical cancer for women. So this shows us in color what is the landscape of cancer in women in our countries. And if we compare the incidence and mortality by country, we're going to have this graphic representation. We have for, for incidence, we have Venezuela first, followed by Colombia, Ecuador, Chile, number four. And in last, we have Peru and Bolivia, according to the incidence. But the mortality, comparative mortality rates that are linked to the incidence show the magnitude of mortality. And in some countries, the mortality is higher to 50% of the incidence. So 100 are diagnosed, but 60 die due to breast cancer in that period. So this shows us the relationship between incidence and mortality. And now I'm going to show you some data of cancer surveillance in Peru. I'm an epidemiologist and I work in cancer surveillance. And this started in Peru in 2006, working with hospital registries and with all the difficulties we have in terms of resources. But here's the data. At this moment, we have 50 hospitals with cancer registry. This, this is a very similar representation to the graph showed by the registry of Lima, which is a population registry that I hope Dr. Dustan will comment, where breast cancer also has a number one. But the epidemiological surveillance allow us to see other things. How does the cancer behaves in different regions of the country? So we have that for the city of Lima that covers almost one third of the population of Peru. Breast cancer is in the leading cause. And in the north, it has the same behavior. But in the center, south, and in the jungle of Peru, in, in the Andes of Peru, the cervical cancer is the leading cause, and breast cancer is number two. That is the importance of having direct information from the hospitals and services. And I show you this chart that in terms of epidemiological surveillance and information for action that we epidemiologists manage should be the most important data of the hospital cancer registers in relation to breast cancer. This graph shows us what is the method for the diagnosis of cancer that can only be obtained in health services. Unfortunately, most, almost 70% of the cases of breast cancer are diagnosed because of the presentation of symptoms. This is, this is a late. When cancer produces symptoms in women and is detected, that means that the cancer is advanced and almost 70% are going to fall in this category. And something very important, what percentage is cancer due to screening methods on which the cancer control strategies focus their greatest effort? This data from hospital registry without any makeup show us that only 4% of cancer that's diagnosed in hospital is detected by screening methods. However, we see with some hope and interesting data. 
that's that cancer detected by incidental image findings. And by analyzing the situation of cancer in the importance of the diagnostic method, imaging, either ultrasound or X-ray or other imaging methods are not a priority. So we hope that this 13% that we see corresponds to mammograms, which will also mean screening. So we have close to 20% of breast cancer cases are detected through screening and at an early stage. And this is these are good news because this means that we've made progress because from the data that the INEN had in 22, screening didn't reach 4%. So now we've reached to approximately 20%. And this is good news, but this also indicates the importance that epidemiological surveillance has in hospital registers of cancer that we, where we need to work. And unfortunately, the clinical staging of cancer of the cases that are diagnosed between 2020-2022 show us this, that most of the cancer is diagnosed in late stages. See the small proportion of cancer that is diagnosed in zero, in situ. We should work in that area and to increase sectors one and two of early cancer and to reduce this large group of stage three, or that 43% and also with this advanced cancer. These are the challenges that we have in public health of Peru that I'm sure it's not different to the situation in other countries. And here I would like to comment on some of the challenges for all of us who work in cancer. The most important challenge is to improve screening coverage the identification of patients in initial stages, in early stages of cancer. And the second part of these challenges as, con as a conclusion is how can we strengthen the use of information? Epidemiological surveillance cannot be excluded from public health interventions. But unfortunately in our country, in our country we've seen that in recent years, those of us who work on information don't have the necessary budget resources and we're trying to improve the quality and coverage of this registry. So the solution is that the information has to be used for interventions, to look for improvement strategies, to look for strategies to improve the quality, but also the use of the, the widespread use of information and to promote research in cancer. Those are the challenges that I leave you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Revilla. It's been an excellent introduction to this topic by sharing the statistics from world studies as well as what was generated through the Ministry of Health and the Andean Health Organization, where we were able to consolidate the information of the situation of cancer in all the Andean countries and was the baseline to prepare the policies on this topic that Dr. Maria del Carmen Calle mentioned that we scope, we hope that is approved in this upcoming ministries, ministers meeting. We should highlight that in the Andean countries, breast cancer and cervical cancer are prevalent in women. And it's also important to indicate that in this issue of communication and information, 
There's a number of challenges that need, we need to improve, strengthen communication, community awareness, and also the information systems need to be have more interactions with the response and intervention teams. And finally, something that is quite relevant that we need to establish a processing data framework that integrates different sources of information from the perspective that you manage of the data for intervention and to improve the opportunity, the early diagnosis and timely treatment. Thank you, Dr. Luis, for your excellent presentation. And we ask you to stay in this room. At, at the end of our meeting, we could do a respond to the question. Thank you very much. We are now, I would like to tell you that due to some difficulties in the connection at the hospital where Dr. Claudia Parra works, she won't, will not be able to join us in this webinar. She has she's apologized for that. So we will continue with our program and we would like to invite and welcome Dr. Jorge Tunsten. Dr. Dustin is a surgical, surgical oncologist, director of the General Office of Cancer Control of the National Institute of Neoplastic Diseases. He's a surgeon of the Department of Breast and Soft Tissue Surgery, coordinator of the Oncologic Surgery Program at the Peruvian University Cayetano Heredia. He's a member of the Peruvian Academy of Surgery. He's a member of the Peruvian Society of Mastology and the Cancer Society. Welcome, dear Dr. Jorge Dustan. You have 20 minutes for your presentation. Muchas gracias, doctor. Gracias. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. Yes, go ahead. In the public policies that we have managed in the country in relation to cancer, there have been different plans, proposals that have been indicating the vision and the treatment or management of cancer and how to try to prevent it and to cure our patients. Since the first proposal of a comprehensive effort of different sectors, since 2007, several laws, documents, plans have been drafted where that have been molding the way how we are trying to deal with cancer. Last year, the national cancer law was enacted following all the things we comment before in terms of how should we approach cancer in this region with a vision of a life course management where we prioritize care, strengthening a network and promoting and research. And, and at present, we have, we need to design the regulation for this law and we are already working. And the most important thing is that for the first time it is stated that we organize a national oncologic network 
that is functional because the truth is that as we know in our country we have a, a quite complex system with different stakeholders and each one has this the different capacities and different responsibilities but could complement each other and what we have defined as a functional network they should work in an organized fashion in order to offer care to a patient with cancer in a geographical area without the need of mobilization of the patient because what we had until a few years ago the cancer management was centered in lima and was not of benefit to the patient or for us so the idea is to decentralize deconcentrate in a gradual fashion and progressively within the vision that the ministry of health has of these health integrated networks that should include the entire structure of health and even stakeholders that don't have to do with care other social parishes and other institutions with regards to breast cancer specifically we've had some important milestones since 2006 we have created this timeline where we have proposed in the upper portion the management of breast cancer at the hospital level and in the lower portion of the line the different technical documents that have been generated or activities that have been carried out in this period since the 2006 peru had the opportunity to participate in a large clinical trial that validated the use of a genetic platform to differentiate what patients with breast cancer could benefit or not with the use of chemotherapy. Peru was the only country in Latin America that participated in this large study. And although we were part of it from the beginning, we see that the approval of Trastuzumab in our country occurred in 2017. And this medication had been approved several years ago before in other countries. In 2018, we implement intraoperatory radiotherapy. In 2020, following a pilot project, we generated evidence through research in the north part of Peru about a proposal of how to improve the care in terms of prevention and diagnosis of cancer that was submitted and was approved in different re meetings. And now we got the good news that we're going to reproduce that study in El Salvador. In terms of documentation in 2011, the first guidelines for clinical practice that was officially approved by the Cancer National Institute that was updated in 2013. The country through the Ministry of Health issued this technical document by presenting one of the first serious analysis in terms of mammary health and proposing what's going to be the strategy for prevention and early diagnosis of breast cancer. In 2018, the, the meeting that I mentioned before where we several countries participated in, we presented the pilot that we have worked. As we can see, was well accepted and this year, we have updated the clinical practice guidelines for the management of breast cancer that has been uh, submitted to the Ministry of Health for its adoption or adaptation, depending on the case. 
but what interests us is that in the management of the patient with breast cancer has to be standardized because it is very important what Dr. Revilla mentioned in addition to improving our surveillance and registration systems and make it in coordination. It is also important on how we evaluate, how we retake what we had formulated to do an effective intervention. Doctor. Could you show in presentation mode so we can see the information that you are presenting? Click there. Okay, great. Thank you. So, this is a document that analyzes cancer and we need to rescue. The PPR started in 2011-2012 as a proposal to allocate resources to prevention and control of cancer. And this document of 2021 collects the information and we can clearly see how there is an improvement in screening through mammograms in breast cancer with this program once it gets stronger. I should highlight that this program during its first three years was in charge of the Institute, but then because of regulatory issues, it became part of a Salud who has more chances of carrying it out nationwide. And in this document, we find that these activities perhaps are going to be the cause by which the clinical staging that Dr. Redilla mentioned have had a discrete improvement in terms of late diagnosis when starting treatment. What is the current situation? We have the indication to work in this national oncologic network that the Cancer Control Office, our institute has started developing some simultaneous activities. And for example, we have started by the analysis of what do we have as a country? What is our capacity, our infrastructure? How many professionals we have? What specialties do they have equipment in order to respond to the needs of the country or the region? Because other things that we realized was the first cancer in frequency in Lima is not necessarily the most frequent in the jungle. So my logic intervention using the information should be to propose an intervention according to epidemiological criteria and infrastructure criteria so that we have, for example, these charts where we have identified with color to, in, to in identify the areas that are ones that need more urgent care and the investment projects, because we're also interested in knowing where there is some type of response or some type of action trying to improve the current situation. And this is with regards to breast cancer, and using the same database, we have that only Gores and health sector, we have collected 39 operating mammographs nationwide. And here I 
would like to insist on what Dr. Revilla mentioned. It is highly probable that we don't have the timely information. And this is the first indication that we can be more proactive and to share the information. You mentioned how important it is to for decision making in a timely basis. We see mammograms and we compare it with other variables, number of radiologists that are available in each department, number of breast surgeons by region and department, the ultrasound equipment that are available and that's it, it in the that's all for imaging diagnostic but and now we see what is the capacity that I have I have a patient with a suspicious lesion what the possibility of performing a biopsy and get to a diagnosis because in the working environments we've seen that perhaps our best chance to improve this cancer treatment will be to optimize and organize and coordinate what is already existing. So that patient that used to wait six months to get specialized treatment now can be can do it in less than one month. Similarly, as in x-rays, we linked pathology in terms of equipment, in terms of infrastructure, staff, and we put that together, x-ray capability, pathology capability, infrastructure, in order to say what is the minimal equipment required so a imaging service can provide an adequate diagnosis in terms of breast cancer. And this is shown in this map, which is a risk map to, and we realize that there are only four regions that will comply with having everything complete to arrive to a diagnos diagnosis with images. It is not true that the other regions don't have anything, but perhaps they, they are lacking one of the aspects that the diagnosis process requires. And the same for pathology by linking technologies in the equipment, in the laboratory to develop a similar map. And then as a research trial, we put together these variables, which are imaging, pathology, surgeons, to try to identify where we will probably have more needs. This is still under development. We still need to link it to the incidence, as we mentioned before, because the incidence is going to set the pace of where we need to intervene more in breast or cervical cervical cancer. And this is what we're doing so far. And we want to show it because we think that this is a tool that is still under construction. It is important to receive all the feedback possible. This is the part that we linked imaging studies, pathology, and specialized breast surgeons. And as you can see, we have large areas in the country where we don't have any response capacity where we need to act quickly. So one minute to highlight what Dr. Revilla mentioned with regards on how to work in a coordinated fashion by improving registry, the 
electronic clinical record is, 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 is a requirement, how to have a surveillance system that we can make timely decisions and to measure what we are doing. And in that regard, it is very important that we all agree. So this information is recorded so that we can all analyze it. Thank you. Okay, this is what I wanted to show you. Thank you, Dr. Jorge Dunstan. Excellent presentation of the reality with regards to the diagnosis of breast cancer in the country and what are the tools or instruments that are being implemented from the regulation through the national cancer law that was enacted in 2021. Another aspect that I think is very important is to strengthen the access of the population to diagnosis and treatment related to the use of information through a strategic mapping of the organization of the fight against cancer in the country and also the use of technology to do the identification of the needs and the capacities both in human resources and equipment, but also in infrastructure and all the different maps that allow us to access to the situation in terms of an institutional response in fighting against cancer. Doctor, it's been an excellent presentation. Please stay in the room so we can answer to the questions that are arriving. Well, now we would like to warmly welcome Dr. Ivan Maldonado. Dr. Ivan Maldonado is a specialist in clinical oncology from the San Francisco University in Quito. He's a specialist in breast cancer by the National Cancer Institute of Mexico, UNAM, medical oncologist at the Metropolitan Hospital in Quito, medical director of the oncology group Onco Hope, women from Ecuador. He is the chairman of the Ecuadorian Multidisciplinary Society of Mastology, member of the societies such as the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, European Society of Medical Oncology, ESMO, Mexican Society of Oncology, SMEO, and Mexican Association of Mastology, AMM. Welcome, dear Dr. Ivan Maldonado. You have 20 minutes for your presentation. You have the floor. Good afternoon, Dr. Bengolea. Thank you very much for the invitation and to the Indian Health Organization to share this dialogue space. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Yes, we can see it. Well, my presentation is focused on the clinical part and I hope I can land some conclusions and perspective about the risk factors in the areas of, of, of uh, timely detection of breast cancer, which are not the same in, in the countries as compar com comparing developed countries with developing countries. This has already been mentioned. The world map in pink, we know that since 2020, breast cancer is the most frequent tumor in women and the one with the highest mortality and has displaced lung cancer. So it's important to pay attention to this type of cancer. In Ecuador, we are not left behind. The first cause in women is breast cancer, more than 3,563 cases. And in terms of mortality, the first cause with more than 1,000 cases that were diagnosed here in Ecuador. 
What are the projections from global can? Well, breast cancer is increasing in cervical and ovary also. For 2040, the expectations are that it's not stable, but there's rather an increase in the incidence. So this is of great concern because we're, from my perspective, we're gonna run out of resources and this is a bubble that we have more problem with access, not only to diagnosis, but also treatment. Something that is important is the differentiation between uh, Latin American countries, or Andean countries with those high income countries where we always hear in all the international presentations and breast cancer congresses, they talk that mortality due to the progress made in adjuvant treatment and screening programs and technology has decreased. But of course, that is not a reality that we have in Ecuador. And I'm sure that that's the same for Latin America and the Andean group. You see that in the US, the mortality has decreasing in recent years. In Ecuador, mortality is still increasing. And as already mentioned, the stages are completely different from the clinical point of view. A special uh, an oncologist specialized in breast cancer that treats in high income countries compared to what we see in Ecuador and in our Latin American country, the stages are two, three, as it was mentioned and are locally advanced where the prognosis changes because the clinical stage is one of the most important prognosis factor for this type of tumors. Same, we can see mortality of countries with high income or medium to low income. For example, Ecuador still increasing. In Mexico, it's still increasing. In Colombia, its mortality is still increasing while in the US, the black line is a clear decline, Spain, Spain the same. So this is a reality that sometimes we read in articles and we hear in big congresses about progress made in this region. It's not affecting our country because mortality is still increasing because of all these issues of registration, epidemiology and diagnosis and treatment. So now speaking about the risk factors for breast cancer, you know that any factor that increases the likelihood of suffering the disease. And as mo in most diseases and tumors, some of them are modifiable and are, others are non-modifiable. Unfortunately, from my perspective, many of the risk factors for breast cancer that are dependent on hormonal or reproductive are not modifiable or susceptible to be mandatory. For example, we can modify diet, consumption of alcohol, smoking, the use of hormonal therapy. We can do education, but some non-modifiable that, that start, still have a high relative risk of increasing the risk of breast cancer, like being a woman, increasing age, genetic history, men, menses age and menopause age are factors and we cannot modify, and perhaps the effort should not focus there on that one we cannot modify for primary prevention. We can classify the risk factors for breast cancer in those biological, women age, family history, first men's menopause age, and presence of mutations, those iatrogenic patients who receive ionizing radiation in the thorax while they, in their childhood, or who have received hormonal replacement therapy for more than five years. No lab, no breastfeeding. First pregnancy after the age of 30. And lifestyles where we can have an impact like obesity, inactivity, alcohol, and tobacco. And analyzing each of these risk factors, the feminine sex, being a woman increases the risk of breast cancer just by the fact of being a woman compared to men. And here we see in this nature reviews table, the estimated new cases in men, 2,650 2, and in women, 281,000. And we have the famous number of relationships that the ratio is 100 to 1. 
100 times more likelihood to have breast cancer in women than in men. But it does exist in men, but there are no guidelines or screening or timely diagnosis for men. We don't have a mammogram for men. We don't recommend self-exam. You should just consider rare cases and there are no guidelines or are extrapolated from women guidelines. In terms of rate, age, there's a cutoff point of year of at the age of 50. We know that this likelihood throughout life from 12 to 14 percent. A woman has just by being a woman throughout her life since she's born till she died is a 40 percent chance of having breast cancer. This depends on age. If it's in younger patients, up to 50 to 59, the risk is 2.1%. From 50 to 60, 2.4%. And it's increasing more than 70 years, 70%. And birth to death is 12.9%. That gives us this number of 14% of patients at risk. This is a value we use. So a woman has an average risk. If it doesn't have any family history risk factor of 14%, of having breast cancer. And this starts at the age of 50. That's why the screening is recommended according to age and needs to be tailored. But some guidelines indicated over the age of 50, others over the age of 40. So this is the risk, as we mentioned, the famous number of one in eight. This is at 70 years age and increases with age. Another risk factor is overweight and obesity. We know that for many types of cancer, not only breast, esophageal, esophageal cancer is the one that has the highest relative risk with body mass index. And we have even class three obesity in patients with breast cancer in the postmenopausal period. It's evidence that it increases the risk. In this study, we can see that the change in weight since the start of the menopause, regardless of the age it started, if more than 10 kilos has been gained with a relative risk of 1.18, so in the postmenopause for the women with overweight and obesity, if there's a gain uh, starting on 5 to 5.9.9, there's a 0 0.8 increase in risk, but more than 10 kills is a 1.18 and an increase in risk of patients in the postmenopausal period. We also have the precursor lesions that are considered risk factors for breast cancer and that need to be identified and should be treated appropriately, have non-proliferative lesions that have no risk for breast cancer, like a simple cyst or ductal ecstasy. Those proliferative lesions without atypy with a relative risk of 1.5, and those who are considered precursors, such as the atypia with proliferative lesions, and these patients should be considered as a high risk. And treated in the screening as of high risk. And those in situ lesions, CDs or CLs, are relative risk of 8 to 10. Mammary density is another risk factor as considered to be important by two reasons. We have studies that indicate that the more dense the breast, there's a higher relative risk of developing breast cancer with an RR of 1.2 when they are heterogeneously dense and 2.1 for women who have breasts who are extremely dense. And we don't know exactly, perhaps there's more estrogens, more glandular tissue and more mammary density in the higher risk. But from the radiological point of view, it's more difficult to detect lesions that may be occult in a breast that's radio opaque and cannot detect calcifications or lesions that may be suggestive, and some of these tumors are missed. Another risk factor are the hormonal and hormonal replacement therapy. As we can see, depends on the years of use. For example, oral contraceptives, a relative risk this study was 1.2 to 1.3 versus those patients who didn't use 
oral contraceptives ever. So the prolonged use increases the risk. We'll have to see risk benefits and indications, especially with more than 10 years, the relative risk is of 1.252. After this continuation, this risk decreases to baseline levels. And in postmenopausal patients, in, we were they use hormonal replacement therapy some years ago without considering the risk factor for breast kidding or the family history. And there's an increased risk with the use of estrogens alone versus estrogen with progesterone. When the use is between five and 10 years, the relative risk or the hazard ratio is 4.6. So you need to be careful with this type of the exogenous use of hormones. Reproductive factors we mentioned have to do with this estrogenic window or the number of years, the more, the more, the higher, the bigger the window to exposure to estrogen, there's a higher chance of breast cancer. If the first menses was at 13 years, the relative risk is 1.27. If it's a, if it happened over the age of 13, if the age of the first uh, birth was greater than 35 years, the relative risk is 1.67. Nuliparus has 1.34. And if the age of menopause is between 50 to 54, it's of 1.38. The issue is that we cannot modify, we cannot tell a woman to have early men's or stop men with menses earlier and to have children before the age of 30 and there are any reason to have children to breastfeed. These are factors that are difficult to modify. This, this westernized lifestyle that are difficult to change or manage. So in prevention, we will need to have an approach for the first level, primary, secondary, and third level. Primary prevention is that towards dealing with the risk factors before the cancer appears and is based on education. Secondary prevention is the timely detection translated with screening and the tools that we may develop and to look for new options together with mammograms and tertiary prevention, which is the timely referral for appropriate treatment because this is a deficit that we have in our countries. In primary prevention, the risk factors that perhaps don't have a greater impact, alcohol, tobacco, or a relative risk of 1.1, perhaps are not the strongest one, but equally important, diet, limiting alcohol, hormonal therapy, but also we have to educate the patients in the stigma of cancer. They are ashamed. Sometimes they don't comment. They are not controlled. They have limited access. The financial situation is low and doesn't allow them to receive an adequate treatment. So primary prevention is important. Perhaps secondary prevention is the one we are focusing strongly, which is the timely detection of early lesions when the neoplasia is present. Ideally, it should be before it emerges, but the secondary. So here we have evidence in this studies, the use of mammograms that have demonstrated an impact in mortality if it's well used and it is follows the coverage recommended by WHO from 50, 60 to 70 years, then they have the diagnosis of breast cancer. NCCN recommends 40 years and on. Here we follow the North American guidance annual after the age of 40 in younger than Europe. And so this recommendation is the one that we're using. And for secondary prevention and a timely detection, we cannot put all the patients in the same group, not all have the same risk, not all 
need they need to stratify the risk and do an evaluation for a personalized intervention not all mammograms at the age of 50 or not all the recommendations starting at 40 but what recommendation each patient requires according to the evaluation of the risk that needs to be done through validated tools such as this gate tire acoustic that can give us a risk in their lifetime on a 10 year risk and classify and classify the patient in the recommendations and we will have to do a risk certification and tertiary prevention have access to adequate treatment because we don't gain anything by doing a, a diagnosis but if there is no biopsy there's no one that can refer it to quality surgery or systemic treatment with access to medications hopefully innovative therapies and radiotherapy with waiting times that are not in months like happens in most of our countries so finally i what are the barriers that i see to decrease mortality and to improve prevention and the treatment of cancer is coverage as dr dunstan mentioned we unfortunately don't have those data as developed as how you presented and i deal with official data, but the coverage is estimated to be less than 10% of mammograms. And that is 70% that WHO suggests to have an impact in the use of this technique. It's not going to have an impact in mortality. 90% of delay in care is three months, 57%, six months delay in care. So these are waiting times between the 11, level one, level two, and level three patients who have to wait three, six, eight months to be able to be evaluated by oncology and go to surgery or chemotherapy or other treatment. There are many problems with care and first level resources, access to cancer studies and issues with referral and uh, timely access to oncological centers. So from my perspective, we need to prioritize strategies, accelerate diagnosis and the start of treatment in women who present symptoms. This is a question that I would like to ask you, perhaps not to focus if we lack resources, if we cannot do a program that covers 70% of mammograms for the population because there are no resources and don't have any impact on mortality. Why don't we think in other strategies to decrease the diagnosis stage and to accelerate timely referrals for treatment. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Excellent presentation, dear Dr. Ivan Maldonado. I think that there are some interesting ideas that you have mentioned and we should highlight. First of all, we see that in Ecuador, breast cancer and and youth cervical cancer are among the leading causes of morbidity statistics. And another important thing that you've mentioned is in the relationship that is more and more growing in the cases of cancer and how cancer mortality in comparison with countries who have a larger development in detecting and treating this condition. One concern that we have in our countries, as in Ecuador, is that the calls established for 2040, the number of cases is going to increase much more than we had anticipated. Another important element for detection is to use the risk factors that has been classified as those that can be modified and those that cannot be modified. And your proposal is that we have some impact on the strategy for 
in control to consider that those care that can be modified and that are part an important part in the strategy for control. You also mentioned uh, among these risk factors that can be modified, the diet where you indicated uh, insisted in overweight and obesity as a critical factor for an increase of cancer. Also alcohol consumption and tobacco and hormonal therapy, which was indicated in the age groups as well as in the younger groups. And you highlighted that within those risk factors that cannot be changed, aging is critical, Gen genetic mutations related to this part of the women's characteristics in terms of inheritance, the reproductive history, early menses and late menopause are at the higher risk for the presentation of cancer. You mentioned the denser the breast, the higher the risk of the presence of this process. In personal history of women who have family with cancer, and that is important to highlight among the risk factors that there's a need to evaluate. An important thing you mentioned is the reproductive history of women in an inadequate or excessive use of alcohol are one of the important factors that increase cancer or the risk of cancer in women. You also mentioned technology, the use of mammography, depending uh, on the uh, North American guidelines in Ecuador in women over the age of 40. But you mentioned that each person, each individual, each woman in, in this case needs a complete diagnosis. And according to that, you will apply the corresponding test. And finally, you told us that breast cancer affects both men as women, the relationship is large, but let's not forget that this disease may also affect men. Thank you very much, dear doctor. It's been an excellent presentation in terms of the clinical approach that we have programmed for this meeting. Once again, we thank all of you who are joining us at this moment, the Andean Health Organization, uh, we would like to greet the Ministry of Health of Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Chile, and Venezuela, also to the Diris Lima Centro, the Peruvian Society of Lymphology and Lymphedema, the National Institute of Health in Lima, Sabogal Hospital, the Onco Hematology Pediatric Service, the hospital in Chimbote CMF, the Dr. Ignacio Chavez, and the ISSSNE from Mexico. Greetings to all the participants in this meeting from Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Cuba, Ecuador, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, and Venezuela. Well, in addition, to, we invite you to follow us in all our networks in, in media, in LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and this conference is being translated to English in our YouTube channel and the thank you of sharing 
this information is going to be very helpful in fighting against this problem and also against the misinformation and infodemia. Well, after this moment of, uh, of uh, learning, it is important to take a space of your time to relax and start a mini session of physical exercise or as Konyo incentivize the well-being of those who are join us in this meeting and in the following minutes we will exercise with an active pose to maintain healthy fight against stress reduce labor fatigue and to maintain our muscles flexible and healthy i highly recommend it go ahead with this active pose there will be no interpretation during the active pause. Hola, hola, muy buenos días, buenas tardes desde el organismo andino de salud y el convenio Hipólito Unanue. Los invitamos a hacer esta pausa de relajación, un automasaje que te va a encantar. Siéntate, disponte de estos minuticos y empieza. Lleva tu cabecita hacia un hombro y hacia el otro. Empieza a dejar la relajación de tu cuello, de tu cuerpo. Inhala profundo. Exhala. Lleva la cabeza de adelante hacia atrás. La idea es que logres desconectarte unos segunditos de tu trabajo y puedas regalarte este pequeño automasaje. Lleva la cabeza hacia el hombro derecho, con la mano contraria vas a empezar a hacer punzoncitos desde el hombro hacia el cuello. Haces como si la mano caminara, punzoncitos con fuerza que realmente distensionen, todo el tiempo con inhalo por nariz, exhalo por boca. Eso es, de arriba hacia abajo, ahora vas a colocar tu manita sobre el hombro y vas a empezar a hacer pequeños como pellizquitos del hombro hacia el cuello, busca ese punto atrás de tu espalda que suele doler, que puede generar tensión y oprime, esto también lo puedes hacer con un aceite, con una cremita. Ahí donde te encuentres, muy bien, regresa suave. Vas a llevar la cabecita al hombro contrario y nuevamente un soncito de arriba hacia abajo. Haz con la yemita de los dedos el movimiento, como caminando hasta el cuello, inhala, exhala. Muy bien. Nuevamente manita sobre el hombro, pellizquitos, pellizquitos de arriba hacia abajo, intenta simplemente relajarte, descansar unos minutos, haz movimientos acá en la zona del hombro, masajeas, masajeas, muy bien, ahora vas a llevar tus dos manitas atrás del cuello, vas a empezar a masajear y vas a hacer como que deslizan las manos de atrás hacia adelante, como si limpiaras tu cuello, entonces inhalo, exhalo, deslizo, inhalo, exhalo, deslizo, eso es, ahora lleva tus manos hacia atrás. Mueve tus dedos de arriba hacia abajo, baja un poco tu cabeza y empiezas a hacer nuevamente los punzoncitos acá en toda la zona cervical, más que todo aquí donde inicia el cabello, masajea de forma circular. Este es un punto de tensión que nos ayuda a quitar dolor de cabeza, dolores musculares, eso es. Masajea de arriba abajo, eso muy bien, con las palmas, con la yemita de los dedos, muy bien, ahora vamos a terminar con un estiramiento que nos ayuda a terminar de relajar, mueve ahí los hombros, lleva la cabeza hacia un hombro, mantén ahí unos segunditos, recuerda la respiración, inhalo, 
exhalo, cambiamos, inhalo, exhalo, palmas en forma de oración, colócalas en el mentón y sube la cabeza, mantén unos segunditos ahí, inhala profundo, exhala, ahora al contrario, hacia abajo, abre fuerza con las manos, muy bien, regresa, eso es, a todos los países, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Perú y Venezuela, desde el Odrascono, les agradecemos por esta pausa de tranquilidad, relajación, espero te haya gustado, chao, chao. Excelente momento, muy reconfortante y también Point. recomendado por nuestros... Recommended by our speakers. To start this dialogue, following the questions, I will ask the speakers to please activate your video. During this webinar, the participants have sent some questions, which I will read. Well, Dr. Luis Revilla, do, do we have evidence of prevalence or incidence of cancer according to age groups? Go ahead, doctor. Well, yes, I don't have that data with me right now. Breast cancer starts presenting early after the age of 30 but the highest risk groups are after the age of 50. I don't have the specific data, but yes, we do have it and they are available according to the coverage of information collection. And this data have to be used at the local level. Thank you, Dr. Luis. What are the most important risk factors to develop breast cancer? Okay, we consider horm hormonal therapy in family planning as a risk factor. I don't know who's going to answer. Dr. Ivan Maldonado will respond because he spoke about the risk factors. Dr. Ivan? It seems that he has left the room. What Dr. Ivan Maldonado mentioned is that hormonal therapy, the use of oral contraceptives for more than 10 years, it, it has been proven to be associated to a higher risk of breast cancer. Also the use of hormonal therapy, especially if, if you use pure estrogens, for the treatment of symptoms from the menopause and also their prolonged use is associated to a higher risk of breast cancer, almost doubles in comparison with women who didn't use hormonal therapy. That was highlighted by Dr. Maldonado and this is what I can recall. Hello? No, sí. soy Dr. Dunstan. no, this is Dr. Dunstan. Sí, sí. Eh, yes. The only that's clearly identified as a risk factor is the use of hormonal replacement therapy. There are controversial results with regards to the hormonal contraceptives. The methods that include hormones, as doctor mentioned in his presentation, it depends on the type of contraceptive used by the woman. If it's estrogens alone or it's in combination or the mini dose or a, a, a high doses that were used 
before. That is going to depends on who is receiving this. There's a double risk if we use a medication that has estrogens alone in a patient that has a family history of risk. And thirdly, the fertility therapy that usually use more progesterone than estrogen, and there hasn't been any evidence that shows in a reliable fashion that it increases the risk of breast cancer in this group. Thank you, Dr. Dustan. There's a question for you. At what age women in Peru can have access to breast cancer screening services? The screening issue, as I mentioned, has to do with the offer of health services to a specific population. The national plan for breast cancer screening that has a technical document, as I show in my one of my slides, indicates screening through the comprehensive health insurance, which is the insurance provided by the government starting on 50, 50 years of age until 69 years of age. But in our health system, we have other subsystems. So sometimes you can find a patient that has a private insurance and the private insurance can pay for mammogram at the age of 40 and over. The same with the periodicity. While it is some particular insurance doing every year while the state promotes every two years. And it, to that, you have to add that the technical document that I mentioned was current until 2021. We press surgeons with the clinical oncologists have worked to update and we have sent a proposal, but I understand that is still in observation because of, of uh, regulatory issues more than care. And we are proposing to change the age following to what doctor said. We have, we, as Dr. Revilla looks at the entire epidemiology of cancer, it's very difficult to remember specific topic, but because I'm a breast surgeon, I have that information very clear for me, and we have more younger patients than in other areas, more than in Europe or the US. So that makes that the proposal goes to increase the screening range for 40, but we have, a, at the end, we agree on 45 years uh, age. And a final question for you. What is the waiting time between diagnosis and the start of treatment in Peru? Depends on what system you're using. In a private system, it's very high, likely that everything is done in 15 days. In a public system, it may occur in what it take one month, but I've seen patients that it has taken up to six months. And the difference is, as we mentioned before, on the possibility of response in the place where it depends where you live. There are remote areas in the jungle or the highlands where the patient will probably have to spend more time re requesting specialized care for the diagnosis compared to a city like Lima or Trujillo. So we're taking 
what was mentioned before, that is precisely what is concerning us. Where should we put our money? Perhaps not to look for the most expensive drug with a, a very sophisticated treatment where I have a very slow diagnosis. What we've seen in the network is that our proposal is to improve diagnosis at the national level. And in that regard, perhaps we're going to move the bottleneck a little bit further. Thank you, Dr. Dustan. We thank you again. And to Dr. Luis Revilla, Dr. Ivan Maldonado, and you for your excellent presentations where we're going to post in our web page. There you can download the video and to see it as many times as you want. Finally, we invite Dr. Maria Carmen Calle for her final closure words on behalf of the Andean Health Organization, Hippolito Inanue Agreement. Thank you. Well, my first words are to thank Dr. Revilla, Dr. Jorge Dunstan, and I think our colleague from Ecuador left. Thank you very much. A very didactic you share with all of those who follow us week after week. I will tell you that we have connected more than 500 people. That's the level of uh, that we can organize. Many clear things have been said, and breast cancer is a public health issue. There are many risk factors that have already been presented. There are many myths also about if they're related with this or the other. But I think that the most important thing is we need to bet for an early diagnosis. That is the issue. And everything that's been done early has better survival and less expenditure from the state because we also need to think that there are expenditures in this disease. It's having the leading, the first uh, most important places in our region and from the Andean Health Organization, we have the cancer policy that we are hoping that it will be approved on November 25th. We have the Andean meeting of the ministers of health, but we, cancer is considered important. So cancer is among the non-communicable diseases, but it was decided to send this uh, topic to a working group and Perhaps for November, they're going to accept the establishment of the Andean Cancer Committee, because we know at this moment, cancer is one of the one. It's the first or the second cause of death in our countries. I think it is important. Two things are important. On one side, to work intensely on early diagnosis, and there's, we need to re constantly review who uh, undergo a mammogram or an ultrasound. We know that mammograms allow us to do an early diagnosis, but we also know that the, the fact of not having family history of breast cancer doesn't mean that you should not do your evaluations. As many people say, my, there's no history in my family, so I don't, I don't need that test. It is important to remember that overweight and obesity is a risk factor that is clearly present. And in our country, the last figures of overweight and obesity in adults and prioritarily in women are, are enormous, more than 60% of overweight and obesity. And this is a risk factor. The use of contraception, and we know that there are other ways of have to do family planning. 
and everything else that has been excellently presented today. The most important, I believe, are controls. The evaluation, every adult, regardless of a man or a woman, should be annually evaluated. And almost all these are present in women, but we should always consider the chances of cancer in men. They're very rare, but there's also breast cancer in men. The other issue is where do we have the diagnostic possibilities in the cancer plans that can the countries organize something very important in addition to have the trained human resources is to have mammograms ultrasound and everything else that can we use to be close to the people that need it and also after this pandemic what we are expecting not only in our country but in several countries is this surgical uh, interventions um, delay because we need to recognize that during the pandemic there's been a delay in the surgical intervention of patients that needed those operations so that also is important somebody said but could say it said it clearly this is the care should be personalized we do screening but when we have something positive the treatment has to be personalized to know what treatment option can we offer we also working in that we are working with the six countries in the drug committee to see the joint negotiation of drugs and i think that the six countries have indicated that oncological drugs on the first line see how can we make them cheaper or decrease the investment in these because that's also a form of inequality. The one that has greater economic capability can afford a more personalized treatment. And in that, I recognize that the National Institute of Cancer Institute is my greetings to Dr. Payet. With all the efforts being carried out to have more personalized treatments to provide the best option for survival to our patients who have breast cancer. And let's not forget of that number that Lucho, one in eight, the risk, how it's increasing, it increases and at the starting at the age of 70. It, you always need to look for it because sometimes we say, no, it's too old. I repeat what general practitioners say. She's old, don't worry, she won't have cervical cancer at the age of 80. Yes, but it may happen. So let's try to evaluate the, the more effective way. So we are waiting for the approval of our policy to start with the implementation of our plan. We know that there are differences in our countries, but we know that there's always a spirit of collaboration and integration. And that is the reason of, its, of the existence of Andean Health Organization. We invite you for our next webinar on next Tuesday, 25th, At 5 p.m., we will talk about care, caring for vision, prevention of blindness with an approach in the life course. And we're fully convinced that together we are stronger 
Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. And together, we get further. Thank you very much once again for your participation. Thank you. Gracias, doctor.